Neo-Nazis are not a new phenomenon. They have been around since the end of World War II, when some former Nazis and their sympathizers tried to continue the legacy of Hitler and his regime. They often express hatred and violence toward racial and ethnic minorities. But what happens when these neo-Nazis end up in jail? Do they get what they deserve, or do they get away with their crimes? And do they change their ways, or do they stay the same? Well, let's find out in this video. Shane Wilson. Tony Shane Wilson was a former Nazi lowrider who had an extensive criminal record. He was already serving a lengthy prison term when he became a witness in a murder case, but his choice came with a heavy price. He was brutally attacked by another prisoner, who slashed his face and neck with a knife. But how did he end up in this situation? Let's dive even deeper into his life story. Wilson was no stranger to trouble. He was a tough guy with a strong look and tattoos all over his body. He was loyal to the bone, following the gang's rules and orders without question. However, his story starts in 2003, when he got tangled up in a murder case in the San Fernando Valley. He was already facing a possible 29-year life sentence behind bars, but he decided to assist the police by sharing information about a suspected murderer named David Steinberg in order to receive a shorter sentence. He had only two choices. One was staying silent, as he knew that talking in court is risky, especially when you are in jail, and his life might be in danger because he was testifying against a dangerous criminal. But staying in prison for so long would also be a living hell, and if he let the murderer walk free, he would come after him sooner or later. It was like standing at a crossroads, with a deep pit behind him and a well in front. So he made a difficult choice. He decided to spill the beans and tell the truth about the criminal in exchange for a lighter sentence of three years. He hoped that he would be protected by the authorities and that he would be able to live a normal life after serving his time. But guess what? He was wrong. He was kept in the same part of the jail as Steinberg and his co-defendants, so close that he could hear them talking to other inmates through the vents. He was scared to death, so he decided to write a letter to his lawyer, sharing his worries about his safety. He believed that someone else in the prison had managed to get hold of his letter and spread the word that Wilson was going to give important testimony against Steinberg. On the day Wilson had to speak in court, Kraut, his friend, called the jail to check if Wilson had returned safely after his time at the courthouse. Kraut also wanted to remind the sheriff's deputies about the potential danger Wilson was in. The sheriff's team took action and moved Wilson to a special cell in a safe part of the jail. But unfortunately, the very next Next day, something terrible happened. On March 27, 2004, just a day after testifying, Wilson found himself alone in his cell. Around 4 p.m., a prisoner approached his cell, carrying a tray bearing a serving of hot dogs and beans. He fumbled the tray, and as Wilson reached through the bars to save his dinner, the prisoner inflicted a five-inch slash across Wilson's face and neck using a homemade knife. Wilson said in an interview that it took 15 minutes for help to arrive, but these minutes felt like an eternity as he had already lost a lot of blood. Wilson also shared that after he was attacked, he fell to the ground and held a towel to his face to try to stop the bleeding. He remembered shouting for help, man down, several times, but it fell on deaf ears. A nearby deputy simply remained on the phone call. His fellow inmates attempted to block out his request for aid, mocking him by saying things like, the joke's on you. Wilson's attacker was Porfiro Avila, a gang member convicted of two murders, including the killing of a witness. He had already been sentenced to life without parole. He was allegedly doing a favor for the Mexican mafia gang which had paid him with drugs and cigarettes. Wilson survived the attack, but he needed 200 stitches to close his wound. He told jailhouse interviewers, I'm a big guy, I'm a bad guy, but after testifying in exchange for a lighter sentence, I was scared for my life. Wilson expressed gratitude for his survival. Instead of aiming his anger at the person who attacked him, Wilson pointed it toward the deputies. Wilson shared, I'm more mad at the deputies who didn't take care of me. They put me in a lion's den, basically. It's ridiculous. They don't really do their job there. He mentioned that he's still scared for his safety but has to testify at Steinberg's trial, scheduled for the summer. He explained that if he doesn't testify, Steinberg might be released, and this could put him in danger of losing his life. Shane Allen Ziska Shane Allen Ziska, a 44-year-old veteran, was a longtime prison guard at the California Institute for Men in Chino. Sounds pretty normal, right? But it turns out that Ziska was secretly aiding the Nazi lowriders in their violent and drug-related activities within the prison walls. And guess what? He ended up getting slapped with a whopping prison sentence of 17 and a half years. Shockingly, federal prosecutors revealed that during this time, from 1984 to 2000, Ziska played a role in distributing methamphetamine and 
various other drugs for the Nazi lowriders gang. Even though he wasn't officially part of the gang, he was like an associate who hung around the edges of the gang. Ziska's involvement extended from relaying messages between gang members to providing information to the gang leaders. He even went so far as to unlock cell doors, basically giving the green light to gang members to stab another prisoner right under his watch. It was a way for them to assert control, to incite fear, and to inflict harm. Ziska was also found to have violated the civil rights of the inmates, but that's not all. Surprisingly, he was also spreading his hate-filled beliefs to other white inmates and instructing gang members in martial arts. During the trial, prison staff and more than 10 inmates provided testimony. Martin Arroyan, who is the chapter president of a significant prison guards union called the California Correctional Peace Officers Association, also testified in support of Ziska's character. Furthermore, defense attorney Ira Salzman said, my client is pleading not guilty and contends he didn't do what he's accused of, but eventually, justice was served, and Ziska ended up behind bars. In 2003, there was a situation involving Ziska that caught the attention of the state legislature. It was discovered that starting in October 2000, Ziska had been placed on paid administrative leave, which means he was not working but still receiving his salary. During this time, he received around $150,000 while staying at home, awaiting the completion of an investigation. After a period of being on leave, he was brought back to work, but in a non-peace officer role, where he he performed clerical tasks or office duties. This continued until formal charges were brought against him, and he was jailed in July 2004. On June 26, 2006, Shane Allen Ziska was sentenced to 17 and a half years in federal prison. He was found guilty of participating in a corrupt organization conspiracy, violent crimes in aid of racketeering, and deprivation of rights under color of law. It was specified that as a federal prisoner, he would have to serve at least 85% of his sentence before being eligible for release. Ziska's reaction to the lengthy prison sentence was negative, and he reportedly cursed at the federal judge, Terry J. Hatter Jr. This entire situation wasn't confined to Ziska alone. It was like a puzzle piece in a much bigger picture. The FBI got involved and found out that the Nazi lowriders weren't just causing trouble in one prison, they were all over the place, in different states' jails, tied up with the Aryan Brotherhood. Timothy Lobdell. Timothy Lobdell, known by his legally changed name, Filthy Fuhrer, is a 46-year-old man already in jail for serious crimes like kidnapping and assault charges, but his involvement goes much deeper. He led a white supremacist gang called the 1488, known for violence and hatred. Lobdell created this gang in 2010, and it operated in and out of prisons in Alaska. The gang's code of conduct is clear. Be white, look white, and act white. The name 1488 refers to different tenets of white supremacy, with 14 standing for the 14 words in a white nationalist creed, we must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children, and 88, possibly referencing the 88 precepts outlined by white supremacist David Lane or standing for Heil Hitler, as H is the eighth letter of the alphabet. This number is a common symbol of neo-Nazism and white nationalism around the world. This fully-fledged hatred gang can be recognized by a 1488 tattoo that depicts an iron cross superimposed over a swastika. Lobdell was serving a 19-year sentence for the attempted murder of an Alaska state trooper. He directed acts of violence to establish the gang's dominance in the prison hierarchy. According to federal officials, Lobdell believed that the activities of some of his gang members were undermining the gang's code of conduct, which includes the creed that, the only currency we recognize is violence and unquestionable loyalty. They refer to the members outside the prison as members of the free world. So to teach them a lesson, he provided a list of specific instructions to one of his lieutenants in the free world. His job was to fulfill the leader's orders. This list mainly contained a series of instructions for murdering two low-ranking members and Staten. Once the two low members were killed, Lobdell called the defender of the gang, Roy Naughton. During this conversation, Naughton informed him about the task assigned and also talked about the next one, Staten. Staten was none other than their own fellow gang member who was ordered to be killed by his own leader. The details of Staten's murder are gruesome and horrifying. Michael Staten, known as Steak Knife in the gang, was accused of stealing from the 1488S and a local Hells Angels gang. In retaliation, Fuhrer ordered 14, 88 members, including Roy Naughton, known as Thumper, Glenn Baldwin, known as Glenn Dog, and Coulter O'Dell, to kill Staten. They also collaborated with Craig King, a member of the Hells Angels. On August 3, 2017, Staten was kidnapped and taken to a King's home in Wasilla, Alaska, where he was taken to a room lined with plastic sheeting, which they used to torture the victim. His hands and feet were bound as he was tortured. His 1488 tattoo was sliced off his rib cage with a hot knife, which was heated with a propane torch. Baldwin and Coulter O'Dell, a prospect in 1488, then took Staten into the woods 
woods where he was shot dead and his body burned. Naughton gave the whole detail to his leader in jail about this gruesome act. For such an accomplishment, Odell was awarded full membership in the 1488 gang. Lobdell officially changed his name after the murder of Staten without being guilty of what he had done. He legally changed his name from Timothy Lobdell to Filthy Fuhrer on July 24, 2017. In a 2019 hearing when he was asked why he changed his name, instead of feeling shameful, he said, I've had nothing but negative things attached to the name. During the same hearing, Fuhrer said, I've tried to be a leader to anyone that has taken a darker path in life because I've been so far down it and turned around. That's what I want to embody. The law finally caught up with Lobdell and four other gang members. On May 2, 2022, all four men involved in the murder of Staten were convicted of racketeering conspiracy, kidnapping resulting in death, kidnapping conspiracy, assault in aid of racketeering, and murder in aid of racketeering. They were sentenced to life in prison without parole. Lobdell was one of the most notorious and violent neo-Nazi leaders in the United States. His behavior was viewed as a danger to both the well-being of the public and the security of the nation, leading the FBI and various law enforcement bodies to perceive him as a serious threat. Robert John Stockton. Stockton's story started back in May 2018, when the officials at High Desert State Prison made a fatal mistake. They wanted to reduce the number of inmates per cell. Therefore, they decided to move Rodney DeLong, a harmless and quiet prisoner, to share a cell with Robert John Stockton, a violent associate of the most dangerous gang called the Aryan Brotherhood. The Aryan Brotherhood is one of the most well-known and violent white supremacist gangs in the United States, and they have a long history of brutal killings and violence, since Stockton had already committed a murder on behalf of the white supremacist gang in 2016. He was certainly not someone to be taken lightly. In the blink of an eye, within only 30 minutes, Stockton brutally attacked his inmate, DeLong, with a homemade weapon and stabbed him multiple times. The murder weapon was crafted from a metal cell door. After that, he dropped the shank and surrendered himself to the corrections officers. At the time of DeLong's death, he had only seven months left to serve for a burglary he had committed. On the other hand, Stockton was serving a life sentence for killing someone named Todd Bates in 1995. Later, DeLong's mother filed a lawsuit. She said that prison officials should have been aware of the animosity between DeLong and the Aryan Brotherhood gang, which meant that Stockton or any other gang member or associate might attack DeLong as soon as they saw him. They should have never put them together in the same cell. The lawsuit also alleged that the prison system failed to protect other prisoners from the violence of gang members like Stockton. Fast forward to 2018, and Stockton's got himself in another fix. He faced charges of two counts of murder, according to court papers in Lassen County. But then in November 2019, he agreed to a deal where he admitted to causing someone's death by accident and received three more years in prison. Now here's where it gets complicated. There's also this massive racketeering case against the leaders of the Aryan Brotherhood. And guess what? Stockton's name keeps coming up in this case. The case was filed in June 2019 by the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of California. It talks about what happened in 2016 when someone from the Aryan Brotherhood gang named Jason Jake Corbett told Stockton to kill Douglas Maynard because he owed the gang money for drugs. The complaint also says that Jason J. Corbett teamed up with a guy named Ronald Dean Yandel and planned uncountable killings. He's one of the leaders of the Aryan Brotherhood. Even though they were in different prisons that were really far apart, they managed to talk using sneaky cell phones. According to the case, Ronald Dean Yandel and Jason Corbett were also planning to kill someone named Paul Dreamer Diaz. They even talked about using someone named Bobby, probably Stockton, to do the dirty work. So after Stockton supposedly stabbed Maynard in prison, an ex member of another gang, Sacramaniacs, told the prosecutors that Corbett hired Stockton because he didn't like him. The plan, as this person said, was to kill two birds with one stone, to get rid of Maynard and also move Stockton away from that part of the prison. In 2018, Stockton had a chance to get a parole hearing, but luck wasn't on his side. But in March 2019, he was rejected for parole for seven years. This was before he agreed to plead guilty to his murder case in November 2019. Furthermore, back in 2015, Stockton lodged a complaint while in jail. He said he was kept in a special part of a prison called Pelican Bay State Prison. He said he joined a hunger strike with other prisoners in the early 2010 as they said that the prison was extremely strict and inhumane. Prison officials say that letting gang leaders hang out in the regular parts of the prison caused more violence, including the murders and attempted murders that are talked about in the Aryan Brotherhood case. But their strike actually worked, and a bunch of prisoners who were said to be part of gangs got moved to the regular parts of the prison. Stockton is still in California State Prison, Sacramento. Todd Stomper Givens.
In the dark world of the Nazi lowriders, there's a guy named Todd Stomper Givens. He was a dangerous killer who was part of neo-Nazism and proudly displays a tattoo of Hitler on his head. He aimed to slash a guard officer's neck to make his grand escape. However, little did Stomper know, his fate wasn't planning on letting him off the hook that easily. So, what actually happened that day? It was a normal day on San Quentin's death row when Stomper attacked a guard with a homemade weapon, hoping to escape from the prison. But he didn't know that the guard had his own secret weapon. For weeks, he diligently worked on crafting that weapon using whatever he could scrounge up within his prison cell. He had sharpened two razor blades and a broken piece of nail clippers and attached them to a handle. He hid it under his mattress, waiting for the right moment to attack the guard. He saw his chance when a new guard came to his prison cell. The guard was young and inexperienced, and he had been transferred from another prison to help with the COVID-19 outbreak at San Quentin. The virus had spread like wildfire among the inmates and staff, killing 11 people and infecting more than 1,200. One day, he saw his opportunity when a guard slid a tray of food through a slot in his door. Quick as lightning, Stomper jumped into action. He grabbed a weapon he had hidden and thrust his arm through the slot, aiming for the guard's throat. But the guard was fast too. He grabbed Stomper's arm and managed to wrestle the weapon away from him. The prison guard felt a sharp pain in his hand and saw blood dripping from a wound. He called for help and soon more guards rushed to the scene. They worked together to control Stomper, making sure he couldn't cause any more trouble. The guard was taken to the hospital where he received five stitches in his hand. He was lucky that Stomper had missed his jugular vein or he would have bled to death. But what led Stomper to end up behind bars? Well, in 1997, Stomper, who was 51 years old at that time, and his wife Lacey, 43 years old, were found to be involved in a horrifying case of double murders. They were responsible for causing the deaths of two siblings. He was found guilty of the murder of Barry Scott Holston and his sister Patrice Holston, aged 32 and from Porterville. Their lives were cut short and their bodies were discovered in a burning car within an olive orchard near Stomper's own home at the time. When they were in court, people said Stomper did it because he thought the person he killed had stolen something from him. Later, it was also revealed that his wife helped him hide the bodies. In 2004, he was handed a death sentence for several serious charges. These included first-degree murder with a deadly weapon, firing a gun intentionally causing severe harm or death, another conviction for first-degree murder, setting fire to property, and causing a fire in a forested area. Lacey, his wife, received a different punishment, though. She was sentenced to spend the rest of her life in prison without any chance of parole. She ended up in Chow Chilla, the women's state prison. During his trial, the prosecutors argued that the tragic deaths of the Holstone siblings were choreographed by the Nazi lowriders prison gang, who wanted to kill Barry. Todd is now behind bars doing writing and drawing to pass his time. He said in a letter, I like to pass the long days by writing and drawing and working out, and just anything to pass the time. Dean McKee. Imagine being stuck in prison for a crime you didn't even commit, and then finally getting out after 30 long years. Well, that's exactly what happened to Dean McKee. Meet Dean McKee, a young teen teenager with a burning swastika tattoo on his chest. His story took a bad turn when he followed his older brother Scott into the dangerous world of neo-Nazism. He was just 16 years old when he became involved in it. In 1987, a tragic event took place at the Tampa Museum of Art. Both McKee brothers were arrested in connection with the murder of a black man, Isaiah Walker. The incident came to light when a museum security guard discovered Walker, a homeless Vietnam veteran, gravely wounded and succumbing to his injuries on the museum's exterior steps. The spotlight of suspicion descends upon none other than the McKee brothers, Dean and Scott. But what really happened that night? The McKee brothers and their buddies were out drinking late that night in Ybor City. On the way back home, Scott was driving under the influence, but his friends convinced him to stop the car. By chance, they pulled over close to the museum, and that's when they accidentally came across Isaiah Walker while they were still drunk. Things got worse when the brothers got into a drunken brawl with Walker, and sadly it ended up leading to Walker's death. But it was their own mother who took a bold step and secretly alerted the police to the possible involvement of her sons. Dean's life took a devastating turn when he was arrested and accused of murdering Walker. But guess what? Scott, the older one, twisted the truth and pinned the whole thing on Dean. In a clever move to make his punishment lighter, he set up a plan to make it seem like Dean was the one who committed the murder. He said that even though both brothers were involved in Walker's assault, Dean was the one who committed the stabbing that caused Walker's death. Because of this, Dean was sentenced to life for the murder, while Scott only ended up serving one year after being C, sentenced to just five. During the trial, there wasn't enough evidence to support Scott's testimony. The friends who were there that night confessed that they were coerced into supporting Scott's story. However, despite this, Dean was sentenced to life in prison, while Scott walked away with just a slap on the wrist. As the prison doors closed behind him, Dean's journey to redemption begins. He was a 16-year-old young man trapped behind bars, denied the chance to finish his education. However, Dean was determined. He earned his GED, participated in
in educational programs and slowly shed his old beliefs, disavowing white supremacy. Throughout his time behind bars, Dean steadfastly maintained his innocence. He insisted that the authorities had been mistaken in identifying him as the culprit. In 2007, Dean took a significant step by requesting the court to conduct DNA testing on the biological evidence found under the victim's fingernails. This appeal caught the attention of the Innocence Project of Florida, which became involved in the case in January 2011. Remarkably, this organization successfully secured DNA testing for the crucial evidence. The special tests on the DNA showed that Dean didn't stab the victim. Representing Dean, the Innocence Project of Florida played a pivotal role in a comprehensive two-day hearing. During this session, they presented the crucial DNA evidence that supported Dean's innocence. Additionally, they introduced new testimonies from witnesses that shed light on the fact that Scott had falsely framed his brother for the murder. Interestingly, two of these new witnesses had dated Scott previously. On October 20, 2017, Dean's murder conviction was overturned. The government sought to maintain the unfair decision by requesting another judgment, but the Innocence Project of Florida ensured Dean's release. He reunited with his family on January 9, 2018. In December 2018, the appeal was dismissed, and in January 2019, the charges against Dean were dropped. Finally, on January 30, 2019, Dean was officially declared innocent after living in prison for three decades. Now Dean is living a whole new life away from the influence of neo-Nazism. He's in Largo, Florida with his wife, Danny. He's now working in construction and has his sights set on opening a tattoo shop. I wasn't gonna let something horrible define. Devin Arthurs. In Tampa, there was a young man named Devin Arthurs, who was connected to a small group of neo-Nazis named Adam Waffen Division. Arthurs confessed to killing his roommates, Andrew Onishuk and Jeremy Himmelman, nearly six years ago, in 2017. He said he did this right after an argument with them. The police found the bodies of Andrew and Jeremy in an apartment they all shared. Devin Arthurs was originally going to go to trial, where a judge and jury would decide if he was guilty. But instead, he chose to admit on his own to a lesser crime called second degree degree murder. He confessed to kidnapping three other people as well. As part of an agreement with the government's lawyers, Devin Arthurs agreed to a 45-year prison sentence. The defense lawyers were prepared to say that Arthurs was not mentally sound when he committed the killings. Mental health professionals had expressed their belief that Arthurs was positioned on the autism spectrum. He also had a mental illness called schizoaffective disorder, which is a mix of schizophrenia and mood problems. But mental health professionals assessed him and determined he was fit to admit his guilt. Devin Arthurs is currently 24 years old. After he finishes his prison sentence, he will be placed on probation for 15 years. This means he will have to follow rules and report to authorities. Additionally, he will need to seek help for his mental health once he is out of prison. This guilty plea from Devin Arthurs happened exactly six years after he committed the crimes. Back then, on May 19, 2017, he went into an office where people rented apartments and told them he had just killed his roommates. The police were called, and they found him at a store with a gun, holding three people inside. He let them go and surrendered to the police. According to Arthurs, he shot his roommates because they mocked him for changing his religion to Islam. He told the police that he had recently become a Muslim, but it seemed like he didn't know much about the religion. The police then found the bodies of Andrew and Jeremy. They had been shot with a type of gun called a Way SR-10 assault rifle. Another roommate, Brandon Russell, was not home when this happened. He saw the scene when he came back and ran out of the house. The police searched the apartment and found materials that showed Brandon had extremist beliefs. You'll be shocked, but the police also found materials about hurting the government and a framed picture of Timothy McVeigh, who had done a big bombing in Oklahoma City. It seemed like Brandon had been idolizing him. Arthurs told the Colby police that his roommates intended to carry out terrorist attacks, possibly targeting nuclear plants. He claimed, I prevented the deaths of a lot of people. When asked why his roommates were planning such an attack, he replied, because they want to build a Fourth Reich. Brandon Russell got arrested because of the dangerous materials and later went to prison for five years. The case against Devin Arthurs took a long time because people were worried about his mental health. He was sent to a special hospital for mental health treatment and was declared unfit to go to trial twice. After more than a year of treatment, he was sent back to the local jail to wait for the trial. While he was in court, Devin Arthur said he had been, during the incident, I was 18 years old and I was brainwashed by the extremist neo-Nazi group he was part of. He mentioned that he had problems with drugs as well. During the court hearing, he sat up straight and spoke after admitting his guilt. I feel that I can be an advocate against extremism. And I'd like to take this moment to tell the world to stay away from extremist groups. And I'm very sorry for everyone that's involved. Um, 
very sorry for everything that has happened. Also, he promised to spend the rest of his life trying to prevent others from getting into similar situations. I feel like I can honor the memory of Jeremy and Andrew by being a better human being, he said. I've let my family down, I've let myself down, I've let my country down, and I think about that every single day. Riley Borghetti, one of the victim's sisters, also talked during the court hearing. She said she has also resolved to be a voice against extremism. This is a system issue, and as long as the rhetoric is what it is in our world, this will continue to happen. Well, do you guys agree with her statement, and do you think Arthur's deserves a chance to redeem himself, or should he face harsher punishment for his crimes? Let us know in the comments below. Thank you for watching this video, and check out these videos on your screen for more similar content.